We're going to start with a meditation. Okay, great. So, kaya wanju wanju nunakot. Hello and welcome, welcome everybody. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I extend this respect to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be listening online or here with us tonight. So let's, I was gonna have a little bit of fun with language. So my name's Sandra Henville and I chair the spiritual education group here at the Buddhist Society and coordinate the Kalyana Friendship Community. And tonight's really special because this is the opening night for the Rains Retreat speaker series. So every year between July and September, all the monks and nuns, go, they, they stay in the monasteries and they don't come to the city to teach, they concentrate on their practice. And instead we have this wonderful um, range of speakers and events which rolls on every Friday night. So in the spirit of welcome, let's have a bit of fun. So I'm going to say some words in, in Noongar and you're, you're going to answer them. First we're going to say hello to each other. So Kaya, Kaya, that means hello. <laughs> so Kaya, deadly yogas, that means hello awesome women. <laughs> Kaya, deadly marmen, hello awesome men. So Kaya. <laughs> so Nanyang Query Sandra. So my name is Sandra. Nunuk Modic. How are you? And you all say, Kaya Nyan Modic. I'm great. So Kaya Nyan Modic. Yeah, I'm great. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> A bit of fun. Nala Jera bin Nunuk no Janju Kadajan Wanakan. We're happy you are coming together, learning and chatting. Bula Kadajam Doin Stoin Shbaragini. Let us share more knowledge. Let us share Kwat Wongi good words. <laughs> so that's a um, little acknowledgement to country. And I will start with a few announcements. And first and foremost, I just want to say a huge thank you because these, um, this retreat, um, Rain's Retreat Speaker Series, is it's quite the orchestration to put on. So there's quite a few people behind the scenes. One of them is Anusha, who is currently in Melbourne. Anusha Yatua, I probably pronounced her surname wrong. But Anusha has done a wonderful job of pulling all of these speakers together. And I'll just make a note of what's coming up. So next Friday, we're going to have Len Warren from the Higher Griva Buddhist Centre. And he is going to be talking about the eight stages of dying. So sounds like a grim topic. And, you know, it's a bit of a taboo topic that people don't really want to think about or... but. It's important. So Len is going to come and chat to us about the work of the Higher Griva Buddhist Centre. Then the week after that, we'll have Imam Shakib, who's the um, Imam at the Perth, Perth Mosque, and he will be talking about peace through Islam. So it's a real variety of stuff that's happening. I think we've even got the Jin Jin Anti-Gravity Centre coming, just to mix it up. <laughs> So, what else? And then a few just general announcements, as we always do. So, the nuns have had their entry to rain ceremony, and the monks was um, last week. The Kuslo Hermitage will have its entry to rain ceremony on Sunday, the 24th of July, and that will be here because they can't have a whole lot of people at the Hermitage, so they're they're going to have their entry ceremony here. Um, there's going to be a big um, birthday auction for Ajahn Brahm's birthday. 
uh, to raise funds, so just have a look at the um, website for more details. The auction has been extended to the 7th of August. Um, there's the Dharmaloka Building Fund. It's now an option for tax-deductible donations. There's, you'll see little um, screens around the place. Um, and Ajahn Brahm has asked us to please be very careful of online donation scams. Um, there's loads of scams at the moment. I'm sure you're all well aware of that. Um, we still need a volunteer gardening coordinator, and if you have got green fingers or even half green fingers, then Bill is the man to speak to. He is waving his arms around. So, gardening with Bill. And the Rains Retreat speakers. So, I told you about the next two speakers coming up, but the theme for this year's program is Journey into the Now. And what does that mean? It means that you, it, it's about using the wisdom of different teachings and practices to allow us to slow down and connect to the present moment. So we're a bit like the Kalamas in the Kalama Sutta. And those familiar with the Kalama Sutta will know the Kalamas lived in a place where there was always different teachers travelling through. And one day they said to the Buddha, we're horribly confused. All these different teachers coming through. What is it that we believe? And the Buddha said to us, he said, don't take any one person as your teacher. Listen, be open. And I guess that's what we're doing with the Rains Retreat. We're inviting a whole lot of different speakers in so that we can listen and we can appreciate all the different faiths and the different teachings. The best way to keep in touch is to keep an eye on the notice boards and Eventbrite and the Facebook pages. I think that's the easiest way. And tonight, um, we're going to, I'm going to lead you in a meditation and then we're going to um, have a bit of a question and answer. Well, I'm going to channel my inner David and Margaret and interview um, Richard Thomas and John Andre Merck, um, who is actually going to join us from Norway, and they produced the movie, A Life of Kindfulness. So we're going to have a chat to them about how this all came about. Then we'll watch the movie and have um, question and answers afterwards. But first and foremost, there's been a lot of racing around to get tonight to happen, and I don't know about you, but I need some downtime, <laughs> some meditation. So I'd like to um, just take you through a gentle guided meditation and then we'll um, get on with the greater program. And for those who don't know me, my name's Sandra and I've been guiding meditations every week for about four years now in different community groups and Buddhist society and different things. So, and what I always tell my groups is that the most important thing about meditation is to make peace, be kind, be gentle, be compassionate to yourself. So you can sit in a chair, you can sit on the floor, however it rolls for you. But let's begin the practice. And I'll just grab the bell so that I can ring it at the end. And what I'd ask you to do is to settle down into your chair. And it's really nice to just put the feet on the floor. It's feeling the contact between the body and the earth. And taking a moment just to feel into the space around us. Feel 
feeling into the space of this beautiful room full of good, kind-hearted, compassionate people all here with a common purpose a common purpose of kindness, of gentleness, of peace And something I learnt from Ashan Brahmali in the spirit of kindness is to gradually let the breath come to you. So when we meditate it's like watching a beautiful sunset and they are such beautiful sunsets this winter and just like the sunset we notice the way The sensations in the body change just like the beautiful colours and clouds on the horizon and we observe We participate We let the breath come to us And greet the breath like a beautiful friend with kindness with love with tranquility and you may ask yourself where is my experience right now How do I experience this body sitting right now?
And the reason we start with the body, this mindfulness of body, is because we can feel into it. It feels real. It feels present and grounded. Our mind may drift and wander as the mind is wont to do. Thoughts like clouds in the sky. The art is to know your thinking. and gently guide yourself back to the beauty of presence. Knowing that you're sitting, knowing that you're breathing, being here right now. body like the ocean, this ocean of experience, breath like the waves, breathing in awareness. Breathing out peace, kindness, love.
Where is your experience now? Open your heart, come into the presence of love, kindness, gentleness, peace. Heart of kindness, as big as an ocean. The breath, like the waves. Gentle, peaceful. And when you become bored of peace, go deeper. Come into the now.
And as we draw close to the end of the meditation, I'd like to offer some words, some phrases of loving kindness. Nyanyin kwap wien, may I be safe, may my spirit be good. Nyanyin kat kwap, may I be mentally happy, may my head and my thoughts be good and at ease. May I be physically happy. May I be well and healthy from my head to my toes. May I walk this earth with ease. Just letting those words settle. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be at ease. May all these beautiful friends, this Kalyana Mitta, in this room, in this hall tonight, may we all be safe, may we all be happy, may we all walk this path with ease. May we know the value of peace. And I'll finish by sounding the bell just keep your eyes closed, enjoy the resonance of the bell. And to finish, and it's quite important you do this. To bring your hands to your heart. It's the way I always like to finish. Just by saying thank you. Say thank you to yourself for taking this time to meditate. Taking this time to enjoy. Coming into the now into this beautiful presence. Then if it feels right to do so, bringing someone to mind in need of a bit of care and kindness right now and wishing for them to, to feel at peace, to feel happy, to move with ease. And gently opening the eyes, turning to the people next to you and saying thank you to them too. So thank you everybody for meditating together. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So we're going to, before we show the movie tonight, we're going to do a little bit of a, I'm going to channel my inner David and Margaret and interview Richard Thomas. So I'd invite Richard to come forward and the AV team 
are going to get John on the screen via Zoom from Norway. <laughs> okay. um, you know, Richard, I was thinking, volunteering at the BSWA is kind of like going to the dana offering at the monastery. You know, you start out and you think, right, I'm going to stick to one theme. And this time, when I go to lunch, I'll have this little piece. And that'll be quite sufficient. That'll be like the, the contribution. And then gradually, you make your way through the pickings. And you find yourself with the whole garam masala. Like you've got the whole plate there. And I feel it's a bit like that volunteering at the Buddhist society at times. You dip your toe in and next thing you've got this incredibly wondrous plate of generosity and kindness and it turns into a big event with a live stream to Norway. So tell me, Richard, how, how did this movie come about? Because I'm sure that there's quite a story involved and a bit of a trajectory. Well, it was just like you said. Uh, the background is that Ajahn was 70 last year, but he was 60 11 years ago. And actually, three of us, Ajahn Brahmali, Burr Sun, and myself, produced a booklet for his 60th birthday, a book called Emptiness and Stillness. And so we'd worked together as a team before for his 60th birthday. And about six years ago, when Ajahn was just a mere 65, one rains retreat, Burr said to me, can you think of anything to do, what could happen for Ajahn's 70th birthday? And I remember 10 years before that, she said something about, can you think what could happen for Ajahn's 60th birthday? And foolishly, I didn't learn. And I said, <laughs> eventually, I said, I think we should produce a quite different sort of book that's much more detailed from very few disciples. And we realized that some people might not want to write a lot of prose, and so it might be better to interview those people. So the idea then was to have a book, but have QR codes in the book so people could immediately go to the interviews. And this, remember, was quite some time ago now, and we weren't so familiar with QR codes unless you went to art galleries and things like that. They weren't very common on advertising. And so one afternoon, we actually shot our first interview. And it was a very, very, very long inter uh, experience because there were lots of technical problems, like batteries running out and that sort of thing, and uh, SD cards having to be changed. So it took a long time. And there were also translations um, because this person couldn't speak English. It was Aya Centini. And at the end of that, we had a meeting between all the people who were supposed to be involved in this book. And someone asked the question, and I was very tired that day, very, very withdrawn. Someone asked the question, well, have you ever seen a book with a QR code in it? And I didn't really answer that question very well. And before I knew it, the, move, the book had become a movie. <laughs> but it was worse than that because I ended up having to do it all. And I became the producer. But luckily, there was a deva at hand, that rains retreat, in the name of, whose name is Burr Sun. And Burr said to me, one of the retreatants in your house is actually a film editor. He was showing me some of his stuff. It's very good. Why don't you have a chat with him? And so, can John hear it? 25 seconds later, he probably will. <laughs> it is going to Norway, to and Oslo. <laughs> and so we basically had an 
we went for a walk and I asked him a lot about movie making and all sorts of questions about what sort of movies he'd made. And it turned out he'd made a movie about a very famous psych sociolog uh, psychologist or sociologist in Norway. And so that was another example of a movie with, a very, with no script. And we talked quite a lot about this and in the end, uh, it became quite clear that John really had the skills to get this into a real production. And it is extremely helpful. It was quite wonderful that he was able to do this because he, he, this, he's a professional. He's in a studio at the moment. And this is his bread and butter, but he volunteered all his huge amount of time to do this. project in England. Venerable Chanda, who was the nun, nun who was interviewed with the fireplace behind her, who said she came out in pity when she heard her second Ajahn Brahm talk. Uh, her website, which is Anna Camper Project, uh, has an ad-free version of the movie. The reason the movie has these ads, and I didn't realise we were going to see one tonight with ads in it, is that uh, there was a trouble with YouTube's assigning copyright. They said that we had not uh, given credit to some people who claim credit for the music for the credits, but actually that was all properly credited, and so we got uh, ads on it. We've not, although we've appealed it, we've not been able to uh, stop this happening, but new versions of the movie, as I say, the Anna Camper Project one has it, are free of ads. I'm very sorry about that. It, that was one of the things we learned, I learned, that uh, you think you've done the movie, the movie finishes, it's all been shown, and, and Nietzsche, it's all finished. And then suddenly people say it's got to go on YouTube and you, you have to put it all up on YouTube and you have to uh, get the blurb right and the title right so that it will be picked up in searches. And there is a technique to do this, to come top of the lists. But this was uh, a bridge too far for us, me. So anyway, and a camper project has an ad-free version. And I posted the YouTube link on the, um, in the chat um, so that the people at home could watch the YouTube. They turn ours off, watch that one. And everyone gets to watch it. And it, it's not a jerky version either. It's a much more smooth progression uh, through, through the whole thing. It's really quite a different experience. Mm -hmm. But what people said in the interviews stands, and that was actually came across quite well, I thought. Uh, so, you know, you got something of it. So, Richard, there's a special request from John. Yes. He says, please have Richard tell us of his completely new way of editing. He knows what I mean. Yeah, well, John and I did have a little discussion on Zoom, and he told me this story. Uh, we, had, we have um, one and a half terabytes of material, and having a data background, I thought the best thing to do was to start to catalogue all this. So I, I dutifully went through all the interviews, and remember they were all about an hour long, some longer, and I, rec I basically for the whole of the interviews, I broke them up into little sections on each topic that they were talking about and wrote metadata for it. And I put this in the system, DaVinci Resolve. And it meant you could just search for your uh, topic and you get all the interviews that cut, touch that topic, which seemed to me a perfectly logical way to do it. But John had never ever seen anything like this before because the way professionals have done it and time in the lot for, for years, years and years, is they have 
they think of it logically as a lot of film, you know, and, and they basically cut it up into little sections. And they have all these bits of film metaphorically hanging on their notice board, and they pick them up. Quite different way of doing it. So we had to change our process, I think. But anyway, apparently professionals think it's very funny that anybody would produce metadata for it all. And Richard, I'm just so impressed with all the different people that you managed to pull together to interview. You've got um, John, former Ajahn Jagara, and you've had even that, that, that person from Africa, was it? it was, yes. It was incredible. Ajahn Rakata. Yeah. Well... Yeah, I mean, how long did it take to get... Because I'm imagining a lot of those interviews would have been done on Zoom. Yes, they were. Because um, of COVID. Because of COVID. Yeah. The, the, the interviewing process took about a year elapsed. Uh, we got quite a lot in the first four or five months. And then the, some of the other ones came in in dribs and bra drabs. So I actually interviewed Venerable Chanda in England uh, over Zoom because someone had to do it. And, we, and we, the original one hadn't worked out. Uh, and, and we just filled in some of these interviews ad hoc. But it was a lot of work. And Ajahn Brahmali really was the driving force behind this. And he had about 20 questions that he would ask them all and tailor it to each individual person. And some of them worked very well and some of them worked not so well. So, for example, the former Ajahn Jagaro, John, uh, who was the first speaker, he, he was really quite wonderful. And in fact, that became the driving piece for the whole movie. Mm. Um, then there was also... Uh, Venerable Analio, who put down the glass or the, the bottle. And he'd actually, when it was still going to be a book, he'd written a wonderful piece, a very scholarly essay, quite short, but he'd done this. And he'd had about this anecdote about putting the glass down. And so I really had to pressure, I think it's fair to say, pressure Ajahn Brahmali to interview him because he's, everybody's very busy. But then it turned out to be this wonderful interview with such a good example of putting the bottle down. And also um, with the, th the thing, things he said about how it had really changed his practice. And you notice there were th two or three interviews where monks had given this very wonderful testimonial of how powerful Ajahn's teachings had been. And so one of the things here is that you never really know what's going to happen. What, it's all in nature. And one shouldn't be too attached to a particular idea because a better one may come along, a better way of doing it may come along. And as you've seen today, there's a lot of dukkha associated with all this too. This is just the way it is. And you just go through it moment or day or month or year by year. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Richard? This is kind of like the director's cut. <laughs> All right. Now, every good Q&A session needs a Dorothy Dix, right? So, the Dorothy Dix of the day is Ajahn Brahmali, who wanted me <laughs> to ask John in Norway, how were the plans for a potential monastery in Norway going? And the answer that was coming back <laughs> was that... Um, yes, please say something, if you may, about the monastery and retreat centre plans we have in Norway. So this is from John. Because it will be the first in the Ajahn Brahm tradition here and the first custom-built retreat centre in the country. He's doing a lot of work with Ajahn Nito, N-I-T-H-O. Nito. Nito. But left Bodhinyana only in 2019 to set this up. And Ajahn Brahmali is so kind and generous to help us build a community by coming here to teach. And he was only having a weekend retreat there two weeks ago. So Ajahn Brahmali just got back from Norway on Sunday or Monday. So yeah, that's amazing. 
So it's, it's truly incredible to see how far Ajahn Brahm's influence reaches. It truly is global. Well, if there's no other questions, then I think we'll call it a night. There was a lot of soup in those pots, so I reckon there is still soup in the pots. So if you'd like some soup before you go home, then feel free. And thank you for persevering with us. And yeah, go check the, um, go check the film out on, on YouTube or via the Kadampa, Kadampa? No, the Anu Kampa. Anu Kampa website. Kadampa's in Fremantle. <laughs> <laughs> this is in England. <laughs> yeah, go check you it out. You can always look up Venerable Chanda, C A N D A U K. Yep, and yes, our next um, Rains Retreat speaker, this will be far less complex technology wise, is going to be Len Warren from the Higher Griva Buddhist Centre, and he is going to come to talk to us about the eight stages of dying, which um, should be very beautiful. Quite a taboo topic for some people, for us Buddhists, not so much. I'm sure you'll get a lot of, um, dare I say it, enjoyment out of his talk. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing you next time. So let's finish off by paying our respects to the, to the Buddha, Dharma Sangha, and we'll call it a night. Thank you. Even chant it out. Arahan Sama Sambodho Bhagawa Udam Bhagawanta Mabewa Devi Bhakato Bhagawata Damo Damam Namasami Supati Palo Bhagavato Sawa.